everyone, I'm Jaden and I am the Head of Legal Updates and Blogs at The Legal Amity and today we're going to do another Insider Info series with Jane. Jane, would you like to introduce yourself? Indeed, my name's Jane Sanders. I'm an unregistered barrister, which means I don't hold a practicing certificate. Uh, I have a suite of companies. The main one that I use is JSCS and through that we undertake specialist legal services, alternative dispute resolution, and anything else that comes up generally within financial services. Okay, brilliant. So one of the main questions that we've um, wanted to ask is, what was the route into your profession? That's a very good question, actually. Um, the route into my profession was always going to be one way for me, and that was going down the path of being a barrister. However, um, I, how I got there was slightly different than, than some people might do in that um, I was already running my husband's business at the time. And one of the reasons that I got into law was because I didn't like the fact that he was being abused in his role as a carpenter. So I like to be able to level, level the playing field, so to speak. So I learned the law. Um, I actually fell into financial services by accident really because I needed a job while I was doing my master's degree I made my one and only application for a job to the financial ombudsman service and got it and ended up working there while I did my uh, master's degree it helped fund it after I finished my master's degree um, I took redundancy from the ombudsman service and I actually whistle blew and that actually got me some notoriety within the pinks the financial papers and at that time, I decided that I was going to go freelance, which I did, um, predominantly for assisting people with any claims they may have, um, bearing in mind that the industry itself, which I had learned about from the Ombudsman Service, is particularly geared towards consumers that have got problems with their investments. But I also found, having whistleblown, that a lot of the processes at the Ombudsman Service didn't necessarily lend themselves for um, a fair resolution for businesses. So at that point, I then decided that I was going to be, I would work for both sides. And that sort of set the, the benchmark for when I went on to do the bar vocational course. And when I finished the bar vocational course, I already had a fairly big demand for my services, which meant that I, I don't practice as a practicing barrister because I haven't done pupillage. But I do have uh, a company through which I trade, which is JSCS, and it's PI in short. I don't hold um, claims management permissions anymore. Instead, I offer specialist legal advice, which I can do under the Legal Services Act. And uh, effectively, I use that to, um, to deal with any and all um, issues that come my way, be it uh, defending uh, a business that's got a problem with, shall we say, the FCA or an unregulated uh, structured product or um, a bond issuer. And there's been quite a lot of the issues there, um, which often involves actually brokering deals between a bond issuer that may well go into insolvency at the risk of loss of 100% of an investment for a consumer and perhaps coming to some sort of negotiated resolution between the bond issuer and up to a thousand bondholders to see if we can restructure something so they don't lose everything and the business manages to keep going. Um, so that was my route into it. It was basically whistleblowing against the Ombudsman Service and finding out that there was a lot more need for specialist legal services to resolve disputes and financial services. Yeah, definitely. So it's quite a personal experience to how you got into your role then. Um, oh, yeah. Very different, definitely. We kind of touched upon this, but what would your kind of day to day role involve? It depends what kind of job I'm on. Um, I have been extremely privileged with um, what I've been able to do. And I say that because obviously alternative dispute resolution is resolving a dispute for someone else. However, there are practical realities that have got to be borne in mind. And the practical reality is that in order to run a business, you have to make money. Um, so my my day to day role would actually involve making sure that I've got enough cash in the bank to pay all my staff. Um, it actually means um, that I've, I've, I've got to make sure that I'm able to cope with the demands of a job that I've got at the moment, because with COVID, my staff are furloughed. Um, as a, a family 
unit. Um, we all live together and work together, which has helped because it means that my girls are still around. One of them is a law student. And so she she can't work for me at the moment because there's just not enough there. But it does mean that I've got additional burdens with making sure things get done. So keeping in touch with the client. Uh, it's fair to say that I'm pretty crap with keeping in touch with my clients. However, because I'm generally good at the technical aspects of my job, um, it, it, it does mean that sort of we balance my weaknesses with their strengths. And it's a very personal relationship that I have with every client that comes to work for me, uh, that comes to instruct me. And it really depends whether I'm working for a business and defending it whether I'm um, working for an insolvency practitioner because I take specialist instructions to insolvency practitioners, specifically in the context of uh, an FCA regulated business that, that might need to go into insolvency. Um, and depending on who I'm working for, it, it dictates what I need to do on a daily basis. Um, as I said, communication. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, communication actually is key. And when people can get me on the phone or when they can get me on an email, communication is fantastic. But because with the additional burden and strain of COVID, it means that my resources are even more limited than they normally would be. I don't have the team that can go in and update. So it, it really depends on the type of job. At the moment, it's, um, it's more laissez-faire because I get in touch with the clients and say to them, look, um, I need to get this over to you today. If you have a look and get it back to me, we'll move that on. But if it's a big job, i.e. something like the FCA, it could well be that um, first thing I do when I start business is to come in, have a call with the client, make a call with the FCA, find out what the lay of the land is, and then go back and advise my client if it's a consumer, it could well be saying, look, we've got no updates from the FSCS at the moment, or it could be um, have a looking, uh, having a look at a case file that comes in and giving an opinion. If it's a business person that's involved in a tax avoidance scheme, it could be anything from reviewing the claim, telling them whether they have got grounds to dispute what's coming in from HMRC. It, it is totally dependent on the scope of the job, what I'm instructed for and what needs to be done. Would you say kind of like the variety of work is something that kind of makes you like your job? That's a, actually a very good question. <laughs> um, I have a, a, an unusual approach to uh, to my my job. Um, I'm this is going to sound a bit odd now. I'm not religious per se, but <laughs> every single client that turns up. And I use my doorstep. I do everything remotely. I have been uniquely privileged to be able to gear my business around my own needs, which is working from home in the middle of a field with all my family around me. And I take each and every client and every person that comes to me um, as a, I take them on as, as a personal commitment. Um, and I consider that a privilege. So in terms of um, actually being able to do a job that I love, it's more than that. This job is a part of my persona. It is the reason that I get up in the morning and it's the reason that I go to bed knackered but happy. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. can turn my hair white, as you can see. Mm -hmm. um, it can turn my brains because I haven't just got one brain. I'm pre pretty sure I've got three or four in there and I have to juggle an awful lot of plates. Mm -hmm. And being the only one in the business that is the fee earner, um, and has technical skills, so I'm told, that, that put me at the top of my field. It mm. often means that I'm juggling an awful lot of plates, um, but you get paid really well for that. Mm. I'm unique in my field, and I, I couldn't be happier about it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that's, like, a really good part of, you know, if you enjoy what, like the saying, if you enjoy what you do, then you don't work a day in your life. I guess that saying, like, really does apply here. Um, another... Oh, thing yeah. as well that um is quite intri an intriguing question as well we kind of touched upon it about um, like the pandemic and stuff um but what are the challenging aspects of your job the challenging aspects of my job are mm. when i've got a difficult client and by difficult i mean that when i when i take a case i will it's not just taking a case 
is working out the psychology of your client. Because if you can't get to grips with your client's personality and what they want, what role they want to take, what their expectations are, you're going to fall on your backside. Mm -hmm. And you're going to fall on your backside in a big way because you won't meet the client's expectations. Um, the other thing that's massively important is, uh, as I said, communication. Communication is key, but it's also, uh, it's also where I'm poor on an updating basis. Mm -hmm. And it's even more poor during COVID. So managing the expectations of my clients during COVID has been crap. And it's been crap because I'm on my own. That's where your negotiation skills and things that you pick up in alternative dispute resolution really come to the fore. Mm -hmm. Because you have to negotiate with your own clients because you're crap at communicating. Mm -hmm. And as I said, their strengths come to the fore when they actually realise when we've touched base. She's the right person to be dealing with this. Thank God she's on my team. Yes, she's a pain in the backside. Um, with regards to updates, but I wouldn't want to go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of the biggest challenges that I faced during COVID. And one of the other biggest challenges is um, it's not just monetary because I've been incredibly fortunate, but it does mean that when you've not got access to as many clients as you would have, as I said, you run a business. Offering a skill is fantastic, but it, it doesn't, doesn't pay your bills. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people often fail to realise that sometimes if you do a lot of pro bono work, which I do, a ton of it, mm -hmm. you then get complaints that you're not moving quick enough. And that's because I haven't got enough money in the bank to actually be able to cover my core outcomes, uh, outgoings. So I have to pull off doing a freebie for somebody else to go in and start pulling in um, paid work. So yeah. everything that I do is geared around being able to free up access and the access is to me, to my time. So that's been massively pressured this year. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine there are some really challenging aspects. And I think, you know, you sound like by acknowledging them as well, that you are definitely kind of being able to reflect upon them as well, which I think is like really important. Um, I think I've had to put it in my terms of business. I have had to put down its... So, um, and the fact that some... The other thing is, the as a as a barrister, um, even though I'm unregistered, parts of the uh, code of conduct for barristers apply, mm -hmm. and one of those things is the cab rank rule, and mm -hmm. the cab rank rule means that you're supposed to take each case as it comes to you. That's all well and good, but if I've got an FCA review where I've got to review 50 cases, and I've got a deadline that bites in three days, but I've got another client that needs assistance with an injunction or something like that. They're competing interests. So my terms of business might be 15 pages long because each person that signs those terms has to understand at a specific given point in time, I may need to slip, split myself into 15 different people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's another aspect of ADR because it may well be that I end up having to, to negotiate with a court for an extension mm -hmm. uh, because I will not allow anything that I'm doing to prejudice a client. So you get real good at negotiating with the Ombudsman Service, mm -hmm. with the FSCS, with anybody that you're opposite poor with whoever you're opposite. Mm -hmm. So it comes, it actually feeds into everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's some like really eye opening things for like future law students or future dispute resolution specialists that kind of want to go into that field as well. Yeah. Um, and kind of touching upon that as well. Um, what advice would you personally give to future or aspiring dispute resolution specialists? Number one, I would say don't be put off by, um, oh, I almost swore then. Um, I'm very informal. Um, mm. And one of the things that I have learned to do since I finished my undergrad is to embrace what I know to be right. Now, um, one of the key pieces of advice that I would give to anybody that wants to come into this profession, and it is a profession, mm -hmm. is to keep your feet on the floor. And keeping your feet on the floor specifically means maintaining conscious competence and not being unconsciously incompetent. Mm -hmm. And that actually translates into be confident, but don't be arrogant. Because mm -hmm. if you're arrogant, you're going to lose business. If you're confident, People are going to they just sit there and love talking to you. You will inspire something in them that your, your counterpart can't. 
you are more likely to get a job and get, get come, somebody to give you a start if you're able to say with confidence, I think I can do this. Because if you start from the premise, oh, I'm frightened, I can't do this, not only have you got, you got, you're going to stymie your own efforts, people also won't employ you. Mm -hmm. So confidence is learned. It is a learned skill. And also, when you get to, to my age, now, I don't let anybody put me off. I don't let anybody tell me that something can't be done. And the things that I've actually achieved as a sole fee earner within a small business is remarkable. So if you've got an idea, stand your ground. You've got to mind your P's and Q's. You don't defer to anyone. Mm -hmm. You want to be in a room with people that are brighter than you, so you learn from them. And I still adhere to that every day. I mm -hmm. learn something new from my clients, from my adversaries, from, from my peers every single day. And if I, if I had to tell myself something now, back when I was 30, bearing in mind that I had my children first before I did my undergrad degree, mm -hmm. it would be, you're doing okay. Keep going. Don't give up. And there are way more ways to skin a cat than one. You don't have to go through the natural um, channels. You don't have to have a first class from Oxford because I got a 2-2. Mm -hmm. And I sit here and laugh when I look at my earnings compared to some people who were really quite rude mm -hmm. and really quite derogatory about me not amounting to this, that and the other because I can't mind my P's and Q's and uh, I might swear or I might be too informal. Rubbish. Mm -hmm. You can yeah, do yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. I think that is something that's a very good piece of advice for many people, um, even outside of dispute resolution as well. I think that applies to a lot of kind of mm -hmm. freelance roles as well, of being able to stand your ground, yep. be confident, but also kind of, you know, being open to learning stuff from your clients as well. Because like you said, your clients do you a lot. So definitely. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for um, this interview anyway. It's been really helpful and I'm sure many people would be able um, to learn so much from this, especially dispute resolution, because ADR is something that is part of the law. And yet I still feel like it's still a niche area. It is. And it could, people could enter it more and more so. so Hugely. I think, yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I think, you know, this kind of should be able to open people's minds to more roles than just solicitor or barrister and you know having being an unregistered barrister and using that to your advantage to go into ADR absolutely and definitely so thank you for you would be advice. amazed how much money you can save a client if you can actually advise them bearing in mind that having the legal skills as well does help yeah. but it doesn't mean to say that I've actually been at a trial I mean I've watched somebody else do it and thought yeah. I could probably have done that better Mm -hmm. um but i'm on that's what i said that's a confidence thing that's not arrogance because i would never be stupid enough to go in and do something like that however mm -hmm. the fact remains if you actually work out what litigation will cost a client and how much you can save that client and their opponents by yeah. actually getting them around a table for mm -hmm. early neutral evaluation or um mediation or even an arbitration that is one hell of a skill to have in your armory because you then end up getting paid top dollars to avoid that. And yeah. it's such fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it really yeah. is. I can't stress enough. You're absolutely correct. The ADR is something that it's, it's underfunded, it's underutilized, and it should be right at the forefront of everything to do with the legal system. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. And I think you know, hopefully this interview today will kind of be able to open people's eyes and open people's minds even to go into a profession that is not just solicitor and barrister, but yet still having that touch with the law for people who like the law, but don't necessarily want to be a solicitor or barrister. So I think ADR is definitely a good route yep. for people to go down as well. You can so, use any degree to get into it. Yeah, 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 even better. You don't even have to have a, just go and pick yourself a really good mediation course. It mm -hmm. doesn't even have to be something that you've done as a profession. If yeah. you are the type of person that can listen to a, a, a problem, mm -hmm. you're relatively analytical and you're relatively confident. I don't see why you can't do ADR. Yeah. And there is such a calling for it. I mean, mm -hmm. it really depends what your passions are. You can find a use for ADR in any context, anything at all in the UK. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I, I think it just goes to show then that it's a really rewarding career then that people should kind of 
look at pursuing as well and something that will benefit so much Absolutely. more people and the skills that come with it as well. Thank you for that, James. It's been really good to speak to you today and I'm sure you've opened you know, so many minds about ADR. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.